Chapter 4 in which Mr. Israel Sneed and other working men receive a lesson in true democracy. Next morning Mr. Blenkinsop went to cut wood for the widow Moran. The good woman was amazed by his highly respectable appearance. "'God help us, ye look like a lawyer,' she said. "'I'm a new man. Cut out the blacksmith's shop and the booze and the bummers. May the good God love and help ye. I heard about it. Ye did? Sure I did. It's all over the town. Good news has a lively foot, man. The shepherd clapped his hands when I told him. Ye got to go straight, my laddie buck. All eyes are on ye now. Come on and see the boy. It's his birthday.' Mr. Blenkinsop was deeply moved by the greeting of the little shepherd, who kissed his cheek and said that he had often prayed for him. "'If you ever get lonely, come and sit with me, and we'll have a talk and a game of dominoes,' said the boy. Mr. Blenkinsop got strength out of the wonderful spirit of Bob Moran, and as he swung his axe that day he was happier than he had been in many years. Men and women who passed in the street said, "'How do you do, Mr. Blenkinsop?' I'm glad to see you. Even the dog Christmas watched his master with a look of pride and approval. Now and then he barked gleefully and scampered up and down the sidewalk. The shepherd was fourteen years old. On his birthday, from morning till night, people came to his room bringing little gifts to remind him of their affection. No one in the village of Bingville was so much beloved. Judge Crooker came in the evening with ice cream and a frosted cake. While he was there, a committee of citizens sought him out to confer with him regarding conditions in Bingville. "'There's more money than ever in the place, but there never was so much misery,' said the chairman of the committee. "'We have learned that money is not the thing that makes happiness,' Judge Crooker began. With everyone busy at high wages and the banks overflowing with deposits, we felt safe. We ceased to produce the necessaries of life in a sufficient quantity. We forgot that the all-important things are food, fuel, clothes, and comfortable housing, not money. Some of us went money mad. With a feeling of opulence, we refused to work at all, save when we felt like it. We bought diamond rings and sat by the fire looking at them. The roofs began to leak and our plumbing went wrong. People going to buy meat found the shops closed. Roofs that might have been saved by timely repairs will have to be largely replaced. Plumbing systems have been ruined by neglect. With all its money, the town was never so poverty-stricken, the people never so wretched. Mr. Sneed, who was a member of the committee, slyly turned the ring on his finger so that the diamond was concealed. He cleared his throat and remarked, "'We mechanics had more than we could do on work already contracted. Yes, you worked eight hours a day and refused to work any longer. You were legally within your rights, but your position was ungrateful and even heartless and immoral. Suppose there were a baby coming at your house, and you should call for the doctor, and he should say, "'I'm sorry, but I have done my eight hours' work today, and I can't help you.' Then suppose you should offer him a double fee, and he should say, "'No, thanks, I'm tired. I've got forty thousand dollars in the bank, and I don't want to work when I don't want to.' Or suppose I were trying a case for you, and when my eight hours' work had expired, I should walk out of the court and leave your case to take care of itself. What do you suppose would become of it? Yet that is exactly what you did to my pipes. You left them to take care of themselves.' You men who use your hands make a great mistake in thinking that you are workers of the country and that the rest of us are your natural enemies. In America we are all workers. The idle man is a mere parasite and not at heart an American. Generally I work fifteen hours a day. This little lad has been knitting night and day for the soldiers without hope of reward and has spent his savings for yarn. There isn't a doctor in Bingville who isn't working eighteen hours a day. I met a minister this afternoon who hasn't had ten hours of sleep in a week. He's been so busy with the sick and the dying and the dead. He is a nurse, a friend, a comforter to anyone who needs him. No charge for overtime. My God, are we all going money mad? 
are you any better than he is or i am or than these doctors are who have been killing themselves with overwork do you dare to tell me that prosperity is any excuse for idleness in this land of ours if one's help is needed judge crooker's voice had been calm his manner dignified but the last sentences had been spoken with a quiet sternness and with his long bony forefinger pointing straight at mr sneed the other members of the committee clapped their hands in hearty approval mr sneed smiled and uh, brushed his trousers i guess you're right he said we're all off our balance a little but what is to be done now we must quit our plumbing and carpentering and lawyering and banking and some of us must quit merchandising and sitting in the chimney corner and grab our saws and axes and go out into the woods and make some fuel and get it hauled into town said judge crooker i'll be one of a party to go to-morrow with my axe i haven't forgotten how to chop the committee thought this a good suggestion they all rose and started on a search for volunteers except mr sneed he tarried saying to the judge that he wished to consult him on a private matter it was indeed just then a matter which could not have been more public although so far the news of it had travelled in whispers the judge had learned the facts since his return i hope your plumbing hasn't gone wrong he remarked with a smile no it's worse than that said mr sneed ruefully they bade the little shepherd good-night and went downstairs where the widow was still at work with her washing although it was nine o'clock faithful woman the judge exclaimed as they went out on the street what would the world do without people like that no extra charge for overtime either then as they walked along he cunningly paved the way for what he knew was coming did you notice the face of that boy he asked yes it's a wonderful face said israel sneed it's a god's blessing to see a face like that the judge went on only the pure in heart can have it the old spirit of youth looks out of his eyes the spirit of my own youth when i was fourteen i think that my heart was as pure as his so were the hearts of most of the boys i knew it isn't so now said mr sneed i fear it isn't the judge answered there's a new look in the face of the young every variety of evil is spread before them on the stage of our little theatre they see it while their characters are in the making while their minds are like white wax everything that touches them leaves a mark or a smirch it addresses them in the one language they all understand and for which no dictionary is needed pictures the flower of youth fades fast enough god knows without the withering knowledge of evil they say it's good for the boys and girls to know all about life well, we shall see mr sneed sat down with judge crooker in the handsome library of the latter and opened his heart his son richard a boy of fifteen and three other lads of the village had been committing small burglaries and storing their booty in a cave in a piece of woods on the river bank near the village a constable had secured a confession and recovered a part of the booty enough had been found to warrant a charge of grand larceny and elisha potts whose store had been entered was clamouring for the arrest of the boys it reminds me of that picture of the robber's cave that was on the billboard of our school of crime a few weeks ago said the judge i'm tired enough to lie down but i'll go and see elisha potts if he's abed he'll have to get up that's all there's no telling what potts has done or may do your plumbing is in bad shape mr sneed the public sewer is backing into your cellar and in a case of that kind the less delay the better he went into the hall and put on his coat and gloves and took his cane out of the rack he was sixty-five years of age that winter it was a bitter night when even younger men found it a trial to leave the comfort of the fireside sneed followed in silence indeed his tongue was shame-bound for a moment he knew not what to say i'm much obliged to you he stammered as they went out into the cold wind i don't care what it costs either the judge stopped and turned toward him look here he said money does not enter into this proceeding or any motive but the will to help a neighbor in such a matter overtime doesn't count they walked in silence for the corner 
There Sneed pressed the judge's hand and tried to say something, but his voice failed him. "'Have the boys at my office at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. I want to talk to them,' said the kindly old judge as he strode away in the darkness. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 In Which J. Patterson Bing Buys a Necklace of Pearls Meanwhile, the Bings had been having a busy winter in New York. J. Patterson Bing had been elected to the board of a large bank in Wall Street. His fortune had more than doubled in the last two years, and he was now a considerable factor in finance. Mrs. Bing had been studying current events and French and the English accent and other social graces every morning with the best tutors as she reclined comfortably in her bedchamber while Phyllis went to sundry shops. Mrs. Crooker had once said, Mamie Bing has a passion for self-improvement. It was mainly, if not quite true. Phyllis had been beating the bush with her mother at teas and dinners and dances and theaters and country house parties in and about the city. The speedometer on the limousine had doubled its mileage since they came to town. They were, it would seem, a tireless pair of hunters. Phyllis's portrait had appeared in the Sunday papers. It showed a face and form of unusual beauty. The supple grace and classic outlines of the latter were touchingly displayed at the dances in many a handsome ballroom. At last they had found a promising and most eligible candidate in Roger Delane, a handsome stalwart youth a year out of college. His father was a well-known and highly successful merchant of an old family which for generations had belonged. That is to say, it had been a part of the aristocracy of Fifth Avenue. There could be no doubt of this great luck of theirs, better indeed than Mrs. Bing had dared to hope for, the young man having seriously confided his intentions to J. Patterson. But there was one shadow on the glowing prospect. Phyllis had suddenly taken a bad turn. She moped, as her mother put it. She was listless and unhappy. She had lost her interest in the chase, so to speak. She had little heart for teas and dances and dinner parties. One day her mother returned from a luncheon and found her weeping. Mrs. Bing went at once to the telephone and called for the stomach specialist. He came and made a brief examination and said it was all due to rich food and late hours. He left the medicine, advised a day or two of rest in bed, charged a hundred dollars, and went away. They tried the remedies, but Phyllis showed no improvement. The young man sent American Beauty roses and a graceful note of regret to her room. "'You ought to be very happy,' said her mother. "'He is a dear.' "'I know it,' Phyllis answered. "'He's just the most adorable creature I ever saw in my life. "'For goodness sake, what is the matter of you?' "'Why don't you brace up?' Mrs. Bing asked with a note of impatience in her tone. "'You act like a dead fish.' Phyllis, who had been lying on the couch, rose to a sitting posture and flung one of the cushions at her mother, and rather swiftly. "'How can I brace up?' she asked with indignation in her eyes. "'Don't you dare to scold me.' There was a breath of silence in which the two looked into each other's eyes. Many thoughts came flashing into the mind of Mrs. Bing. Why had the girl spoken the word you so bitterly? Little echoes of old history began to fill the silence. She arose and picked up the cushion and threw it on the sofa. What a temper! she exclaimed. Young lady, you don't seem to know that these days are very precious for you. They will not come again. Then, in the old fashion of women who have suddenly come out of a moment of affectionate anger, they fell to weeping in each other's arms. The storm was over when they heard the feet of J. Patterson Bing in the hall. Phyllis fled into the bathroom. "'Hello,' said Mr. Bing as he entered the door. "'I found out what's the matter with Phyllis. It's nerves. I met the great specialist John Hamilton Gibbs at luncheon today. I described the symptoms.' He said it's undoubtedly nerves. He has any number of cases just like this one. Rest, fresh air, and a careful diet are all that's needed. He says that if he can have her for two weeks, he'll guarantee a cure. I've agreed to have you take her to his sanitarium in the Catskills tomorrow. 
He has saddle horses, sleeping balconies, toboggan rides, snowshoe and skating parties, and all that. I think it will be great, said Phyllis, who suddenly emerged from her hiding place and embraced her father. I love it. I'm sick of this old town. I'm sure it's just what I need. I couldn't go tomorrow, said Mrs. Bing. I simply must go to Mrs. Delane's luncheon. Then I'll ask Harriet to go up with her, said J. Patterson. Harriet, who lived in a flat on the Upper West Side, was Mr. Bing's sister. Phyllis went to bed dinnerless with a headache. Mr. and Mrs. Bing sat for a long time over their coffee and cigarettes. It's something too dreadful that Phyllis should be getting sick just at the wrong time, said the madame. She has always been well. I can't understand it. She's had a rather strenuous time here, said J. Patterson. But she seemed to enjoy it until, well, until the right man came along, the very man I hoped would like her. Then suddenly she throws up her hands and keels over. It's too devilish for words. Mr. Bing laughed at his wife's exasperation. To me it's no laughing matter, said she with a serious face. Perhaps she doesn't like the boy, J. Patterson remarked. Mrs. Bing leaned toward him and whispered, "'She adores him.' She held her attitude and looked searchingly into her husband's face. "'Well, you can't say I did it,' he answered. "'The modern girl is a rather delicate piece of machinery. I think she'll be all right in a week or two. Come, it's time we went to the theatre if we're going.' Nothing more was said of the matter. Next morning, immediately after breakfast, Aunt Harriet set out with Phyllis in the big limousine for Dr. Gibbs's sanitarium. Phyllis found the remedy she needed in the ceaseless round of outdoor frolic. Her spirit, washed in the glowing air, found refreshment in the sleep that follows weariness and good digestion. Her health improved so visibly that her stay was far prolonged. It was the first week of May when Mrs. Bing drove up to get her. The girl was in perfect condition, it would seem. No rustic maid in all the mountain valleys had lighter feet or clearer eyes or a more honest ruddy tan in her face due to the touch of the clean wind. She had grown as lithe and strong as a young panther. They were going back to Bingville next day. Martha and Susan had been getting the house ready. Mrs. Bing had been preparing what she fondly hoped would be a lovely surprise for Phyllis. Roger Delane was coming up to spend a quiet week with the Bings, a week of opportunity for the young people with saddle horses and a new steam launch and a Peterborough canoe and all pleasant accessories. Then on the 20th, which was the birthday of Phyllis, there was to be a dinner and a house party and possibly an announcement and a pretty wagging of tongues. Indeed, J. Patterson had already bought the wedding gift, a necklace of pearls, and paid a hundred thousand dollars for it and put it away in his safe. The necklace had pleased him. He had seen many jewels, but nothing so satisfying, nothing that so well expressed his affection for his daughter. He might never see its like again. So he bought it against the happy day which he hoped was near. He had shown it to his wife and charged her to make no mention of it until the time was ripe, in his way of speaking. Mrs. Bing had promised on her word and honor to respect the confidence of her husband with all righteous intention, but on the very day of their arrival in Bingville, Sophronia, Mrs. Pendleton, Ames, called. Sophronia was the oldest and dearest friend that Mamie Bing had in the village. The latter enjoyed her life in New York, but she felt always a thrill at coming back to her big garden and the green trees and the ample spaces of Bingville, and to the ready sympathetic confidence of Sophronia Ames. She told Sophronia of brilliant scenes in the changing spectacle of metropolitan life, of the wonderful young man and the untimely affliction of Phyllis, now happily passed. Then, in a whisper, while Sophronia held up her right hand as a pledge of secrecy, she told of the necklace of which the lucky girl had no knowledge. Now, Mrs. Ames was one of the best of women. People were wont to speak of her, and rightly, as the salt of the earth. She would do anything possible for a friend, but Mamie Bing had asked too much. 
Moreover, always it had been understood between them that these half-playful oaths were not to be taken too seriously. Of course, the fish had to be fed, as Judge Crooker had once put it. By the fish he meant that curious underlife of the village, the voracious, silent, merciless, cold-blooded thing which fed on the sins and follies of men and women, and which rarely came to the surface to bother anyone. The fish are very wise, Judge Crooker used to say. They know the truth about everyone, and it's well that they do. After all, they perform an important office. There's many a man and woman who think they've been fooling the fish, but they've only fooled themselves. And within a day or two, the secrets of the Bing family were swimming up and down the stream of the underlife of Bingville. Mr. Bing had found a situation in the plant which was new to him. The men were discontented. Their wages were sky-high, to quote a phrase of one of the foremen. Still, they were not satisfied. Reports of the fabulous earnings of the mill had spread among them. They had begun to think that they were not getting a fair division of the proceeds of their labor. At a meeting of the help, a radical speaker had declared that one of the Bing women wore a noose of pearls on her neck worth half a million dollars. The men wanted more pay and less work. A committee of their leaders had called at Mr. Bing's office with a demand soon after his arrival. Mr. Bing had said no with a bang of his fist on the table. A workers' meeting was to be held a week later to act upon the report of the committee. Meanwhile, another cause of worry had come, or rather returned, to him. Again, Phyllis had begun to show symptoms of the old trouble. Mrs. Bing, arriving at dusk from a market trip to Hazelmead with Sophronia Ames, had found Phyllis lying asleep among the cushions on the great couch in the latter's bedroom. She entered the room softly and leaned over the girl and looked into her face, now turned toward the open window and lighted by the fading glow in the western sky and relaxed by sleep. It was a sad face. There were lines and shadows in it which the anxious mother had not seen before, and had she been crying? Very softly the woman sat down at the girl's side. Darkness fell. Black, menacing shadows filled the corners of the room. The spirit of the girl betrayed its trouble in a sorrowful groan as she slept. Roger Delane was coming next day. There was every reason why Phyllis should be happy. Silently Mrs. Bing left the room. She met Martha in the hall. "'I shall want no dinner, and Mr. Bing is dining in Hazelmead,' she whispered. "'Miss Phyllis is asleep. Don't disturb her.' Then she sat down in the darkness of her own bedroom, alone. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 In which Hiram Blenkinsop has a number of adventures the shepherd of the birds had caught the plague of influenza in March and nearly lost his life with it. Judge Crooker and Mr. and Mrs. Singleton and their daughter and Father O'Neill and Mrs. Ames and Hiram Blenkinsop had taken turns in the nursing of the boy. He had come out of it with impaired vitality. The rubber tree used to speak to him in those days of his depression and say, "'It will be summer soon.' "'Oh, dear, but the days pass so slowly.' Bob would answer with a sigh. Then the round nickel clock would say cheerfully, I hurry them along as fast as ever I can. Seems as if old time was losing the use of his legs, said the shepherd. I wouldn't wonder if someone had run over him with an automobile. Everybody is trying to kill time these days, ticked the clock with a merry chuckle. Bob looked at the clock and laughed. You've got some sense, he declared. Nonsense, the clock answered. You can talk pretty well, said the boy. I could run, too. If I couldn't, nobody would look at me. The more I look at you, the more I think of Pauline. It's a long time since she went away, said the shepherd. We must all pray for her. Not I, said the little pine bureau. Do you see that long scratch on my side? She did it with a hat pin when I belonged to her mother, and she used to keep her dolls in my lower drawer. Mr. Bloggs assumed a look of great alertness, as if he spied the enemy. 
"'What's the use of worrying?' he quoted. "'You better lie down and cover yourself up, or you'll never live to see her or the summer either,' the clock warned the shepherd. Then Bob would lie down quickly and draw the clothes over his shoulders and sing of the good King Wenceslaus and the first Noel which Miss Betsy Singleton had taught him at Christmas tide. All this is important only as showing how a poor lad of a lively imagination was wont to spend his lonely hours. He needed company, and he knew how to find it. Christmas Day, Judge Crooker had presented him with a beautiful copy of Raphael's Madonna and Child. It's the greatest theme and the greatest picture this poor world of ours can boast of, said the judge. I want you to study the look in that mother's face, not that it is unusual. I have seen the like of it a hundred times. Almost every young mother with a child in her arms has that look, or ought to have it, the most beautiful and mysterious thing in the world. The light of that old star which led the wise men is in it, I sometimes think. Study it, and you may hear voices in the sky, as did the shepherds of old. So the boy acquired the companionship of those divine faces that looked down at him from the wall near his bed, and had something to say to him every day. Also, another friend, a very humble one, had begun to share his confidence. He was a little yellow dog, Christmas. He had come with his master one evening in March to spend a night with the sick shepherd. Christmas had lain on the foot of the bed and felt the loving caress of the boy. He never forgot it. The heart of the world that loves above all things the touch of a kindly hand was in this little creature. Often, when Hiram was walking out in the bitter winds, Christmas would edge away when his master's back was turned. In a jiffy he was out of sight and making with all haste for the door of the widow Moran. There he never failed to receive some token of the generous woman's understanding of the great need of dogs, a bone or a doughnut or a slice of bread soaked in meat gravy, and a warm welcome from the boy above stairs. The boy always had time to pet him and play with him. He was never fooling the days away with an axe and a saw in the cold wind. Christmas admired his master's ability to pick up logs of wood and heave them about and to make a great noise with an axe, but in cold weather all that was a bore to him. When he had been missing, Hiram Blenkinsop found him always, at the day's end, lying comfortably on Bob Moran's bed. May had returned with its warm sunlight, the robins had come back, the blue martins had taken possession of the birdhouse. The grass had turned green on the garden borders and was now sprinkled with the golden glow of dandelions. The leaves were coming out, but Pat Crawley was no longer at work in the garden. He had fallen before the pestilence. Old Bill Rutherford was working there. The shepherd was at the open window every day, talking with him, and watching, and feeding the birds. Now, with the spring, a new feeling had come to Mr. Hiram Blenkinsop. He had been sober for months. His old self had come back, and had imparted his youthful strength to the man Hiram. He had money in the bank. He was decently dressed. People had begun to respect him. Every day Hiram was being nudged and worried by a new thought. It persisted in telling him that respectability was like the Fourth of July, a very dull thing unless it was celebrated. He had been greatly pleased with his own growing respectability. He felt as if he wanted to take a look at it from a distance, as it were. That money in the bank was also nudging and calling him. It seemed to be lonely and longing for companionship. Come, Hiram Blankensop, it used to say, let's go off together and get a silk hat and a gold-headed cane and make em set up and take notice. Suppose you should die sudden and leave me without an owner. The warmth and joy of the springtime had returned his fancy to the old dream. So one day he converted his bank balance into a roll big enough to choke a dog and took the early morning train to Hazelmead, having left Christmas at the Widow Moran's. In the mill city he bought a high silk hat and a gold-headed cane and a new suit of clothes and a boiled shirt and a high collar and a red necktie. It didn't matter to him that the fashion and fit of his garments was not 
quite in keeping with the silk hat and the gold-headed cane. There were three other items in the old dream of splendor. The mother, the prancing team, and the envious remarks of the onlookers. His mother was gone. Also, there were no prancing horses in Hazelmead, but he could hire an automobile. In the course of his celebration, he asked a lady, whom he met in the street, if she would kindly be his mother for a day. He meant well, but the lady, being younger than Hiram, and not accustomed to such familiarity from strangers, did not feel complimented by the question. They fled from each other. Soon Hiram bought a big custard pie in a bake shop, and had it cut into smallish pieces, and, having purchased pie and plate, went out upon the street with it. He ate what he wanted of the pie, and generously offered the rest of it to sundry people who passed him. It was not impertinence in Hiram. It was pure generosity, a desire to share his riches, flavored in some degree by a feeling of vanity. It happened that Mr. J. Patterson Bing came along and received a tender of pie from Mr. Blenkinsop. No, said Mr. Bing, with that old hammer-whack in his voice, which aroused bitter memories in the mind of Hiram. That tone was a great piece of imprudence. There was a menacing gesture and a rapid succession of footsteps on the pavement. Mr. Bing's retreat was not, however, quite swift enough to save him. The pie landed on his shoulder. In a moment Hiram was arrested and marching toward the lockup while Mr. Bing went to the nearest drug store to be cleaned and scoured. A few days later Hiram Blinkensop arrived in Bingville. Mr. Singleton met him on the street and saw, to his deep regret, that Hiram had been drinking. "'I've made up my mind that religion is good for some folks, but it won't do for me,' said the latter. "'Why not?' the minister asked. "'I can't afford it.' "'Have you found religion a luxury?' Mr. Singleton asked. "'It's grand while it lasts, but it's like a pison getting over it,' said Hiram. "'I feel kind of ruined.' "'You look it,' said the minister, with a glance at Hiram's silk hat and soiled clothing. "'A long spell of sobriety is hard on a man if he quits it sudden. "'You've had your day of trial, my friend. "'We all have to be tried sooner or later. "'People begin to say, "'At last he's come around all right. "'He's a good fellow.' "'And the Lord says, "'Perhaps he's worthy of better things. "'I'll try him and see.' "'That's his way of pushing people along, Hiram. "'He doesn't want them to stand still. "'You've had your trial and failed, but you mustn't give up. "'When your fun turns into sorrow, as it will, "'come back to me and we'll try again.' "'Hiram sat dozing in a corner of the barroom of the Eagle Hotel that day. "'He had been ashamed to go to his comfortable room over the garage. "'He did not feel entitled to the hospitality of Mr. Singleton.' Somehow he couldn't bear the thought of going there. His new clothes and silk hat were in a state which excited the derision of small boys and audible comment from all observers while he had been making his way down the street. His money was about gone. The barkeeper had refused to sell him any more drink. In the early dusk he went out of doors. It was almost as warm as midsummer, and the sky was clear. He called at the door of the widow Moran for his dog. In a moment Christmas came down from the shepherd's room and greeted his master with fond affection. The two went away together. They walked up a deserted street and around to the old graveyard. When it was quite dark they groped their way through the weedy briared aisles between moss-covered poplin stones to their old nook under the ash tree. There Hiram made a bed of boughs, picked from the evergreens that grow in the graveyard, and lay down upon it under his overcoat with the dog Christmas. He found it impossible to sleep, however. When he closed his eyes, a new thought began nudging him. It seemed to be saying, "'What are you going to do now, Mr. Hiram Blenkinsop?' He was pleased that it seemed to say, "'Mr. Hiram Blenkinsop.' He lay for a long time looking up at the starry moonlit sky and at the marble weather-spotted angel on the monument to the Reverend Thaddeus Sneed, who had been lying there among the rude forefathers of the village since. Suddenly the angel began to move. 
Mr. Blenkinsop observed with alarm that it had discovered him, and that its right forefinger was no longer directed toward the sky, but was pointing at his face. The angel had assumed the look and voice of his old self, and was saying, I don't see why angels are always cut in marble and set up in graveyards with nothing to do but point at the sky. It's a cold and lonesome business. Why don't you give me a job? His old self vanished, and as it did so, the spotted angel fell to coughing and sneezing. It coughed and sneezed so loudly that the sound went echoing in the distant sky, and so violently that it reeled and seemed to be in danger of falling. Mr. Blenkinsop awoke with a rude jump, so that the dog Christmas barked in alarm. It was nothing but the midnight train from the south pulling out of the station, which was near the old graveyard. The spotted angel stood firmly in its place, and was pointing at the sky as usual. It was probably an hour or so later when Mr. Blenkinsop was awakened by the barking of the dog Christmas. He quieted the dog and listened. He heard a sound like that of a baby crying. It awoke tender memories in the mind of Hiram Blenkinsop. One very sweet recollection was about all that the barren, bitter years of his young manhood had given him worth having. It was the recollection of a little child which had come to his home in the first year of his married life. She lived eighteen months and three days and four hours, he used to say, in speaking of her with a tender note in his voice. Almost twenty years she had been lying in the old graveyard near the ash tree. Since then the voice of a child crying always halted his steps. It is probable that in her short life the neglected, pathetic child Pearl, that having been her name, had protested much against a plentiful lack of comfort and sympathy. So Mr. Blenkinsop's agitation at the sound of a baby crying somewhere near him in the darkness of the old graveyard was quite natural and will be readily understood. He rose on his elbow and listened. Again he heard that small, appealing voice. "'By thunder, Christmas!' he whispered. "'If that ain't like Pearl when she was a little teeny weeny thing, no bigger than a pint of beer. Say it is, sir, sure as sin!' He scrambled to his feet, suddenly, for now also he could distinctly hear the voice of a woman crying. He groped his way in the direction from which the sound came, and soon discovered the woman. She was kneeling on a grave with a child in her arms. Her grief touched the heart of the man. "'Who be you?' he asked. "'I'm cold, and my baby is sick, and I have no friends,' she sobbed. "'Yes, you have,' said Hiram Blenkinsop. "'I don't care who you be. I'm your friend, and don't you forget it.' There was a reassuring note in the voice of Hiram Blenkinsop. Its gentleness had in it a quiver of sympathy. She felt it, and gave to him— an unknown, invisible man, with just a quiver of sympathy in his voice, her confidence. If ever any one was in need of sympathy, she was at that moment. She felt that she must speak out to someone. So keenly she felt the impulse that she had been speaking to the stars and the cold gravestones. Here at last was a human being with a quiver of sympathy in his voice. I thought I would come home, but when I got here I was afraid, the girl moaned. I wish I could die. No, you don't neither, said Hiram Blenkinsop. Sometimes I thought that I hadn't no friends and wanted to die, but I was just fooling myself. To be sure, I ain't had no baby on my hands, but I've had something just as worrisome, I guess. Folks like you and me has got friends aplenty, if we only give them a chance. I've found that out. You let me take that baby and come with me. I know where you'll get the glad hand. You just come along with me. The unmistakable note of sincerity was in the voice of Hiram Blenkinsop. She gave the baby into his arms. He held it to his breast a moment, thinking of old times. Then he swung his arms like a cradle, saying, You stop your hollering, you caldern little skeezook. It ain't decent to go on that way in a graveyard, and you ought to know it, be you trying to awake the dead. The baby grew quiet, and finally fell asleep. Come on now, said Hiram, with the baby lying against his breast. You and me are going out of the past. 
I know a little house that's next door to heaven. They say ye can see heaven from its winders. It's where the good shepherd lives. Christmas and I know the place, don't we, old boy? Come right along. There ain't no kind of doubt of what they'll say to us. The young woman followed him out of the old graveyard and through the dark, deserted streets until they came to the cottage of the widow Moran. They passed through the gate into Judge Crooker's garden. Under the shepherd's window, Hiram Blenkinsop gave the baby to its mother, and with his hands to his mouth called, Bob! in a loud whisper. Suddenly a robin sounded his alarm. Instantly the shepherd's room was full of light. In a moment he was at the window, sweeping the garden paths and the treetops with his searchlight. It fell on the sorrowful figure of the young mother with the child in her arms and stopped. She stood looking up at the window, bathed in the flood of light. It reminded the shepherd of that glow which the wise men saw in the manger at Bethlehem. "'Pauline Baker!' he exclaimed. "'Have you come back, or am I dreaming?' "'It's you, thanks to the Blessed Virgin. "'It's you. Come around to the door. "'My mother will let you in.' "'It was a warm welcome that the girl received "'in the little home of the widow Moran. "'Many words of comfort and good cheer "'were spoken in the next hour or so, "'after which the good woman made tea and toast "'and broiled a chop and served them in the shepherd's room. "'God love you, child. "'So he was a merry man.' "'Bad says to him and the like to him,' she said as she came in with the tray. "'Mother of Jesus, what a wicked world it is!' The prudent dog Christmas, being afraid of babies, hid under the shepherd's bed, and Hiram Blenkinsop lay down for the rest of the night on the lounge in the cottage kitchen. An hour after daylight, when the judge was walking in his garden, he wondered why the widow and the shepherd were sleeping so late. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7, in which high voltage develops in the conversation. It was a warm, bright May day. There was not a cloud in the sky. Roger Delane had arrived, and the Bings were giving a dinner that evening. The best people of Hazelmead were coming over in motor cars. Phyllis and Roger had had a long ride together that day on the new Kentucky saddle horses. Mrs. Bing had spent the morning in Hazelmead and had stayed to lunch with Mayer and Mrs. Stacy. She had returned at four and cut some flowers for the table and gone to her room for an hour's rest when the young people returned. She was not yet asleep when Phyllis came into the big bedroom. Mrs. Bing lay among the cushions on her couch. She partly rose, tumbled the cushions into a pile, and leaned against them. "'Heavens, I'm tired!' she exclaimed. "'These women in Hazelmead hang on to one like a lot of hungry cats. They all want money for one thing or another, Red Cross or Liberty Bonds or fatherless children or tobacco for the soldiers or books for the library. My word, I'm broke, and it seems as if each of my legs hung by a thread.' Phyllis smiled as she stood looking down at her mother. "'How beautiful you look!' the fond mother exclaimed. "'If he didn't propose today, he's a chump.' "'But he did,' said Phyllis. "'I tried to keep him from it, but he just would propose in spite of me.' The girl's face was red and serious. She sat down in a chair and began to remove her hat. Mrs. Bing rose suddenly and stood facing Phyllis. "'I thought you loved him,' she said with a look of surprise. "'So I do,' the girl answered. "'What did you say?' "'I said no.' "'What?' "'I refused him.' "'For God's sake, Phyllis, do you think you can afford to play with a man like that? He won't stand for it.' "'Let him sit for it, then. And, mother, you might as well know, first as last, that I am not playing with him.' There was a calm note of firmness in the voice of the girl. She was prepared for this scene. She had known it was coming. Her mother was hot with irritating astonishment. The calmness of the girl in suddenly beginning to dig a grave for this dear ambition, rich with promise, in the very day when it had come submissively to their feet, stung like the tooth of a serpent. She stood very erect and said with an icy look in her face, "'You young upstart, what do you mean?' There was a moment of frigid silence in which both of the women began to turn cold. 
Then Phyllis answered very calmly as she sat looking down at the bunch of violets in her hands. It means that I am married, mother. Mrs. Bing's face turned red. There was a little convulsive movement of the muscles under her mouth. She folded her arms on her breast, lifted her chin a bit higher, and asked in a polite tone, although her words fell like fragments of cracked ice, Married? To whom are you married? To Gordon King. Phyllis spoke casually as if he were a piece of ribbon that she had bought at a store. Mrs. Bing sank into a chair and covered her face with her hands for half a moment. Suddenly she picked up a slipper that lay at her feet and flung it at the girl. My God, she exclaimed, what a nasty liar you are. It was not ladylike, but at that moment the lady was temporarily absent. "'Mother, I'm glad you say that,' the girl answered, still very calmly, although her fingers trembled a little as she felt the violets, and her voice was not quite steady. "'It shows that I am not so stupid at home as I am at school.' The girl rose and threw down the violets and her mild and listless manner. A look of defiance filled her face and figure. Mrs. Bing arose, her eyes aglow with anger." I'd like to know what you mean, she said under her breath. I mean that if I am a liar, you taught me how to be it. Ever since I was knee-high, you have been teaching me to deceive my father. I am not going to do it any longer. I am going to find my father and tell him the truth. I shall not wait another minute. He will give me better advice than you have given, I hope. The words had fallen rapidly from her lips, and as the last one was spoken, she hurried out of the room. Mrs. Bing threw herself on the couch where she lay with certain bitter memories, until the new maid came to tell her that it was time to dress. She was like one reminded of mortality after coming out of ether. "'Oh, Lord!' she murmured wearily. "'I feel like going to bed. How can I live through that dinner? Please bring me some brandy.' Phyllis learned that her father was at his office, whither she proceeded without a moment's delay. She sent in word that she must see him alone, and as soon as possible. He dismissed the men with whom he had been talking, and invited her into his private office. "'Well, girl, I guess I know what is on your mind,' he said. "'Go ahead.' Phyllis began to cry. "'All right. You do the crying, and I'll do the talking,' he went on. I feel like doing the crying myself, but if you want the job, I'll resign it to you. Perhaps you can do enough of that for both of us. I began to smell a rat the other day, so I sent for Gordon King. He came here this morning. I had a long talk with him. He told me the truth. Why didn't you tell me? What's the good of having a father unless you use him at times when his counsel is likely to be worth having? I would have made a good father if I had had half a chance. I should like to have been your friend and confidant in this important enterprise. I could have been a help to you. But somehow I couldn't get on the board of directors. You and your mother have been running the plant all by yourselves, and I guess it's pretty near bankrupt. Now, my girl, there's no use crying over spilt tears. Gordon King is not the man of my choice, but we must all take hold and try to build him up. Perhaps we can make him pay." "'I do not love him,' Phyllis sobbed. "'You married him because you wanted to? You were not coerced?' "'No, sir.' "'I'm sorry, but you'll have to take your share of the crow with the rest of us,' he went on, with a note of sternness in his tone. "'My girl, when I make a contract, I live up to it, and I intend that you shall do the same. You'll have to learn to love and cherish this fellow, if he makes it possible. I'll have no welching in my family.' You and your mother believe in woman's rights. I don't object to that, but you mustn't think that you have the right to break your agreements unless there's a good reason for it. My girl, the marriage contract is the most binding and sacred of all contracts. I want you to do your best to make this one a success. There was the tinkle of the telephone bell. Mr. Bing put the receiver to his ear and spoke into the instrument as follows. Yes, she's here. I knew all the facts before she told me. Mr. Delane? He's on his way back to New York, left on the 610, charged me to present his regrets and farewells to you and Phyllis. I thought it best for him to know and to go. 
Yes, we're coming right home to dress. Mr. King will take Mr. Delane's place at the table. We'll make a clean breast of the whole business. Brace up and eat your crow with a smiling face. I'll make a little speech and present Mr. and Mrs. King to our friends at the end of it. Oh, now cut out the sobbing and leave this unfinished business to me, and don't worry. We'll be home in three minutes. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 In Which Judge Crooker Delivers a Few Opinions The pride of Bingville had fallen in the dust. It had arisen and gone on with soiled garments and lowered head. It had suffered derision and defeat. It could not ever be the same again. Sneed and Snodgrass recovered, in a degree, from their feelings of opulence. Sneed had become polite, industrious, and obliging. Snodgrass and others had lost heavily in stock speculation through the failure of a broker in Hazelmead. They went to work with a will, and without the haughty independence, which for a time had characterized their attitude. The spirit of the little shepherd had entered the hearts and home of Emmanuel Baker and his wife. Pauline and the baby were there and being tenderly loved and cared for. But what humility had entered that home! Phyllis and her husband lived with her parents, Gordon having taken a humble place in the mill. He worked early and late. The Bings had made it hard for him, finding it difficult to overcome their resentment, but he stood the gaff, as they say, and won the regard of J. Patterson, although Mrs. Bing could never forgive him. In June there had been a public meeting in the town hall addressed by Judge Crooker and the Reverend Mr. Singleton. The judge had spoken of the grinding of the mills of God that was going on the world over. Our civilization has had its time of trial not yet ended, he began. Its enemies have been busy in every city and village. Not only in the cities and villages of France and Belgium have they been busy, but in those of our own land. The Goths and Vandals have invaded Bingville. They have been destroying the things we loved. The false god is in our midst. Many here, within the sound of my voice, have a God suited to their own tastes and sins, an obedient, tractable, boneless God. It is my deliberate opinion that the dances and costumes and moving pictures we have seen in Bingville are doing more injury to civilization than all the guns of Germany. My friends, you can do nothing worse for my daughter than deprive her of her modesty, and I would rather, far rather, see you slay my son than destroy his respect for law and virtue and decency. The jazz band is to me a sign of spiritual decay. It is a step toward the jungle. I hear in it the beating of the tom-tom. It's not music. It is the barbaric yawp of sheer recklessness and daredevilism, and it is everywhere. Even in our economic life we are dancing to the jazz band, and with utter recklessness. American labor is being more and more absorbed in the manufacture of luxuries, embroidered frocks and elaborate millinery and limousines, and laudelettes and rich upholstery and cord tires and golf courses and sporting goods and great country houses, so that there is not enough labor to provide the comforts and necessities of life. The tendency of all this is to put the stamp of luxury upon the commonest needs of man. The time seems to be near when a boiled egg and a piece of buttered bread will be luxuries, and a family of children an unspeakable extravagance. Let us face the facts. It is up to vanity to moderate its demands upon the industry of man. What we need is more devotion to simple living and the general welfare. In plain, old-fashioned English, we need the religion and simplicity of our fathers. Later, in June, a strike began in the big plant of J. Patterson Bing. The men demanded higher pay in shorter days. They were working under a contract, but that did not seem to matter. In a fight with scabs and Pinkerton men, they destroyed a part of the plant. Even the life of Mr. Bing was threatened. The summer was near its end when J. Patterson Bing and a committee of the labor union met in the office of Judge Crooker to submit their differences to that impartial magistrate for adjustment. The judge listened patiently and rendered his decision. It was accepted. 
When the papers were signed, Mr. Bing rose and said, Your Honor, there's one thing I want to say. I have spent most of my life in this town. I have built up a big business here and doubled the population. I have built comfortable homes for my laborers and taken an interest in the education of their children and built a library where anyone could find the best books to read. I have built playgrounds for the children of the working people. If I have heard of any case of need, I have done my best to relieve it. I have always been ready to hear complaints and treat them fairly. My men have been generously paid, and yet they have not hesitated to destroy my property and to use guns and knives and clubs and stones to prevent the plant from filling its contracts and to force their will upon me. How do you explain it? What have I done or failed to do that has caused this bitterness? Mr. Bing, I am glad that you asked me that question, the old judge began. It gives me a chance to present to you and to these men who work for you a conviction which has grown out of impartial observation of your relations with each other. First, I want to say to you, Mr. Bing, that I regard you as a good citizen. Your genius and generosity have put this community under great obligation. Now, in heading toward the hidden cause of your complaint, I beg to ask you a question at the outset. Do you know that unfortunate son of the widow Moran known as the Shepherd of the Birds? I have heard much about him, Mr. Bing answered. Do you know him? No, I have had letters from him acknowledging favors now and then, but I do not know him. We have hit at once the source of your trouble, the judge went on. The shepherd is a representative person. He stands for the poor and the unfortunate in this village. You have never gone to see him because, well, probably it was because you feared that the look of him would distress you. The thing which would have helped and inspired and gladdened his heart more than anything else would have been the feel of your hand and a kind and cheering word and sympathetic counsel. Under those circumstances, I think I may say that it was your duty as a neighbor and a human being to go to see him. Instead of that, you sent money to him. Now, he never needed money. In the kindest spirit, I ask you if that money you sent to him in the best of good will was not, in fact, a species of bribery. Were you not, indeed, seeking to buy immunity from a duty incumbent upon you as a neighbor and a human being? Mr. Bing answered quickly, There are plenty of people who have nothing else to do but carry cheer and comfort to the unfortunate. I have other things to do. That, sir, does not relieve you of the liabilities of a neighbor and a human being, in my view. If your business has turned you into a shaft or a cogwheel, it has done you a great injustice. I fear that it has been your master, that it has practiced upon you a kind of despotism. You would better get along with less, far less business, than suffer such a fate. I don't want to hurt you. We are looking for the cause of a certain result, and I can help you only by being frank. With all your generosity, you have never given your heart to this village. Some unkind people have gone so far as to say that you have no heart. You cannot prove it with money that you do not miss. Money is good, but it must be warmed with sympathy and some degree of sacrifice. Has it never occurred to you that the warm hand and the cheering word in season are more, vastly more, than money in the important matter of making good will? Unconsciously you have established a line and placed yourself on one side of it and the people on the other. Broadly speaking, you are capital and the rest are labor whereas, in fact, you are all working men. Some of the rest have come to regard you as their natural enemy. They ought to regard you as their natural friend. Two kinds of despotism have prevented it. First, there is the despotism of your business in making you a slave, so much of a slave that you haven't time to be human. Second, there is the despotism of the labor union in discouraging individual excellence, in demanding equal pay for the faithful man and the slacker, and in denying the right of free men to labor when and where they will. All this is tyranny as gross and un-American as that of George the Third in trying to force his will upon the colonies. If America is to survive, we must set our faces against every form of tyranny. 
the remedy for all our trouble and bitterness is real democracy which is nothing more or less than the love of men the love of justice and fair play for each and all you men should know that every strike increases the burdens of the people every day your idleness lifts the price of their necessity idleness is just another form of destruction why should you not have listened to the council of reason in june instead of in september and thus have saved these long months of loss and hardship and bitter violence it was because the spirit of tyranny had entered your heart and put your judgment in change it has blinded you to honor also for your men were working under contract if the union is to command the support of honest men it must be honest it was tyranny that turned the treaty with belgium into a scrap of paper that kind of a thing will not do here let me assure you that tyranny has no right to be in this land of ours you remind me of the prodigal son who had to know the taste of husks and the companionship of swine before he came to himself do you not know that tyranny is swine and the fodder of swine it is simply human hoggishness i have one thing more to say and i am finished mr bing some time ago you threw up your religion without realizing the effect that such an act would be likely to produce on this community you are no doubt aware that many followed your example i've got no preaching to do i'm just going to quote you a few words from an authority no less respectable than george washington himself our history has made one fact very clear namely that he was a wise and far-seeing man judge crooker took from a shelf john marshall's life of washington and read it is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion let it simply be asked where is the security for property for reputation for life if a sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice let me add on my own account that the treatment you receive from your men will vary according to their respect for morality and religion they can manage very well with an irreligious master for you are only one but an irreligious mob is a different and highly serious matter believe me away back in the seventeenth century john dryden wrote a wise sentence it was this i have heard indeed of some very virtuous persons who have ended unfortunately but never of a virtuous nation providence is engaged too deeply when the cause becomes general if virtue is the price of a nation's life let us try to keep our own nation virtuous mr bing and his men left the judge's office in a thoughtful mood the next day judge crooker met the mill owner on the street judge i accept your verdict said the latter i fear that i have been rather careless it didn't occur to me that my example would be taken so seriously i have been a prodigal and have resolved to return to my father's house ho oh, servants said the judge with a smile bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry we shall have to postpone the celebration said mr bing i have to go to new york to-night and i sail for england to-morrow but i shall return before christmas a little farther on mr bing met hiram blenkinsop the latter had a plank on his shoulder i'd like to have a word with you said the mill owner as he took hold of the plank and helped hiram to ease it down i hear many good things about you mr blenkinsop i fear that we have all misjudged you if i have ever said or done anything to hurt your feelings i am sorry for it hiram blenkinsop looked with astonishment into the eyes of the millionaire i guess i ain't got your place right not exactly said he some folks ain't as good as they look and some ain't so bad as they look i wouldn't wonder if we was mostly pretty much alike come to shake us down let's be friends anyhow said mr bing if there's anything i can do for you let me know 
that evening as he sat by the stove in his little room over the garage of mr singleton with his dog christmas lying beside him mr blenkinsop fell asleep and awoke suddenly with a wild yell of alarm what's the matter a voice inquired mr blenkinsop turned and saw his old self standing in the doorway nothing but a dream said blenkinsop as he wiped his eyes dreamed i had a dog with a terrible thirst on him used to lead him around with a rope and when we come to a brook he'd drink it dry suddenly i felt an awful jerk on the rope that sent me up in the air and i looked and to see that the dog had turned into an elephant and that he was a-goin like sam hill and that i was hitched to him and i couldn't let go once in a while he'd stop and drink a river dry and then he'd lay down and rest everybody was scared of the elephant and so was i and i'd try to cut the rope with my jackknife but it wouldn't cut it was so dull then all of a sudden he'd start on the run and twitch me over the hills and mounting and me taking steps a mile long and scared to death the fact is you're hitched to an elephant his old self remarked the first thing to do is to sharpen your jackknife it's night and silence that sets him going said blenkinsop when they come he's apt to start for the nighest river the old elephant is beginning to move blenkinsop put on his hat and hurried out of the door end of chapter eight chapter nine which tells of a merry christmas day in the little cottage of the widow moran night and silence are a stern test of wisdom for years the fun-loving chattersome blenkinsop had been their enemy and was not yet at peace with them but night and silence had other enemies in the village ancient and inconsolable enemies it must be said they were the cocks of bingville every morning they fell too and drove night and silence out of the place and who shall say that they did not save it from being hopelessly overwhelmed day was their victory and they knew how to achieve it noise was the thing most needed so they roused the people and called up the lights and set the griddles rattling the great white cock that roosted near the window in the widow moran's hen-house watched for the first sign of weakness in the enemy when it came he sent forth a bolt of sound that tumbled silence from his throne and shook the foundations of the great dome of night it rang over the housetops and through every street and alley in the village that started the battle silence tried in vain to recover his seat in a moment every cock in bingville was hurling bombs at him immediately darkness began to grow pale with fright seeing the fate of his ally he broke camp and fled westward soon the field was clear and every proud cock surveyed the victory with a solemn sense of large accomplishment the loud victorious trumpets sounding in the garden near the window of the shepherd awoke him that christmas morning the dawn light was on the windows merry christmas said the little round nickel clock in a cheerful tone it's time to get up is it morning the shepherd asked drowsily as he rubbed his eyes sure it's morning the little clock answered that lazy old son is late again he ought to be up and at work he's like a dishonest hired man he's apt to be slow on christmas morning said the shepherd then people blame me and say i'm too fast the little clock went on they don't know what an old shirk the sun can be i've been watching him for years and have never gone to sleep at my post after a moment of silence the little clock went on hello the old knight is getting a move on it the cocks are scaring it away santa claus has been here he brought ever so many things the midnight train stopped i wonder who came said the shepherd i guess it was the bings the clock answered just then it struck seven then i guess that's about the end of it said the little clock of what the shepherd asked of the nineteen hundred and eighteen years you know seven is the favored number in sacred history i'm sure the baby would have been born at seven my goodness there's a lot of ticking in all that time i've been going only twelve years and i'm nearly worn out some young clock will have to take my job before long these reflections of the little clock were suddenly interrupted the shepherd's mother entered with a merry greeting and turned on the lights there were many bundles lying about she came and kissed her son and began to build a fire in the little stove 
"'This'll be the merriest Christmas in your life, laddie boy,' she said as she lit the kindling. "'A great doctor's come up with the bings to see you. He says he'll have you out of doors in a little while.' "'Ho, ho, that looks like the war was nearly over,' said Mr. Bloggs. Mrs. Moran did not hear the remark of the little tin soldier, so she rattled on. "'I went over to the station to meet him last night. Mr. Blenkinsop has brought us a fine turkey. We'll have a grand dinner, sure we will, and I asked Mr. Blenkinsop to come in eat with us.' Mrs. Moran opened the gifts and spread them on the bed. There were books and paints and brushes and clothing and silver articles and needlework and a phonograph and a check from Mr. Bing. The little cottage had never seen a day so full of happiness. It rang with talk and merry laughter and the music of the phonograph. Mr. Blenkinsop had come in his best mood and apparel with the dog Christmas. He helped Mrs. Moran to set the table in the shepherd's room and brought up the platter with the big brown turkey on it, surrounded by sweet potatoes, all just out of the oven. Mrs. Moran followed with the jelly and the creamed onions and the steaming coffee pot and new celery. The dog Christmas growled and ran under the bed when he saw his master coming with that unfamiliar burden. He's never seen a Christmas dinner before. I don't wonder he's kind of scared. I ain't seen one in so long I'm scared myself, said Hiram Blinkensop as they sat down at the table. What's scaring you, man? said the widow. Fraid I wake up and find myself dreaming, Mr. Blinkensop answered. "'Nobody ever found himself dreaming at my table,' said Mrs. Moran. "'Grab a carving knife and go to work, man. "'I ain't exactly used to this kind of a job, "'but if you'll look out the window, "'I'll have it chopped and split and corded in a minute,' said Mr. Blenkinsop. "'He got along very well with his task. "'When they began eating, he remarked, "'I've been looking at that picture of a girl with a baby in her arms. "'Brings the water to my eyes. "'It's so kind of lifelike and natural.' It's an A number one picture, no mistake. He pointed at a large painting on the wall. It's Pauline, said the shepherd. Sure, she's one of the saints of God, the widow exclaimed. She started a school for the children of them Italians and Poles. She's trying to make them good Americans. I'll never forget that night, Mr. Blenkinsop remarked. If you don't forget it, I'll never mend another hole in your pants, the widow answered. I've never blabbed a word about it to anyone but Mr. Singleton. Keep that in your soul, man. It's your ticket to paradise, said the widow. She goes every day to teach the Poles and Italians. But I have her here with me always, the shepherd remarked. I'm glad when the morning comes so that I can see her again. God bless the child. We was sorry to lose her, but we have the picture and the look of her with the love of God in her face, said the widow Moran. "'Now light your pipe and take your comfort, man,' said the hospitable widow, after the dishes were cleared away. "'Sure, it's more like Christmas to see a man and a pipe in the house. Heavens no, a man in the kitchen is worse than a hole in your petticoat.' So Mr. Blenkinsop sat with the shepherd while the widow went about her work. With his rumpled hair, clean-shaven face, long nose, and prominent ears, he was not a handsome man." "'This is the top notch, and no mistake,' he remarked as he lighted his pipe. "'Blenkinsop is happy. He feels like his old self. He has no fault to find with anything or anybody.' Mr. Blenkinsop delivered this report on the state of his feelings with a serious look in his grey eyes. "'It kind of reminds me of the time when I used to hang up my stocking and look for the reindeer tracks in the snow on Christmas morning,' he went on. Since then, my old socks have been full of pain and trouble every Christmas. Those I knit for you here left full of good wishes, said the shepherd. Say, when I put em on this morning with the biled shirt and the suit that Mr. Bing sent me, my old self came and asked me where I was going. And when I said I was going to spend Christmas with a respectable family, he said, I guess I'll go with you. So here we be. The old cells of the village have all been kicked out of doors, said the shepherd. The other day you told me about the trouble you had had with yours. That night all the old cells of Bingville got together down in the garden and talked and talked about their relatives so I couldn't sleep. It was a kind of self-land. I told Judge Crooker about it, and he said that that was exactly what was going on in the town hall the other night at the public meeting. The folks are drunk, as drunk as I was in Hazelmead last May, said Mr. Blenkinsop. 
They have all been drunk with gold and pleasure. The fruit of the vine of plenty, said Judge Crooker, who had just come up the stairs. Merry Christmas, he exclaimed as he shook hands. Mr. Blenkinsop, you look as if you were enjoying yourself. And why not when yourself has been away and just got back? And you've killed the fatted turkey, said the judge, as he took out his silver snuff-box. One by one the prodigals are returning. They heard footsteps on the stairs and the merry voice of the widow Moran. In a moment Mr. and Mrs. Bing stood in the doorway. Mr. and Mrs. Bing, I want to make you acquainted with my very dear friend Robert Moran, said Judge Crooker. There were tears in the shepherd's eyes as Mrs. Bing stooped and kissed him. He looked up at the mill owner as the latter took his hand. "'I am glad to see you,' said Mr. Bing. "'Is this, is this Mr. J. Patterson Bing?' the shepherd asked, his eyes wide with astonishment. "'Yes, and it is my fault that you do not know me better. I want to be your friend.' The shepherd put his handkerchief over his eyes. His voice trembled when he said, "'You have been very kind to us.' "'But I'm really hoping to do something for you,' Mr. Bing assured him. "'I've brought a great surgeon from New York who thinks he can help you. He will be over to see you in the morning.' They had a half-hour's visit with the little shepherd. Mr. Bing, who was a judge of good pictures, said that the boy's work showed great promise and that his picture of the mother and child would bring a good price if he cared to sell it. When they arose to go, Mr. Blenkinsop thanked the mill owner for his Christmas suit. Oh, don't mention it, said Mr. Bing. Well, it mentions itself pretty middle and often, Mr. Blenkinsop laughed. Is there anything else I can do for you? the former asked. Well, sir, to tell you the dead honest truth, I've got a new ambition, said Mr. Blenkinsop. I've thought of it nights a good deal. I'd like to be a sextant of the church and ring the old bell. "'We'll see what can be done about it,' Mr. Bing answered with a laugh, as they went downstairs with Judge Crooker, followed by the dog Christmas, who scampered around them on the street with a merry growl of challenge, as if the spirit of the day were in him. "'What is it that makes the boy so appealing?' Mr. Bing asked the judge. "'He has a wonderful personality,' Mrs. Bing remarked. "'Yes, he has that.' but the thing that underlies and shines through it is his great attraction. What do you call it? Mrs. Bing asked. A clean and noble spirit. Is there any other thing in this world that in itself is really worth having? Compared with him, I recognize that I am very poor indeed, said J. Patterson Bing. You are what I would call a promising young man, the judge answered. If you don't get discouraged, you're going to amount to something. I am glad because you are, in a sense, the father of the great family of Bingville. End of chapter 9 End of The Prodigal Village, A Christmas Tale by Irving Batchelor.